This is our home, the planet Earth. A beautiful place to live. I wouldn't want to go to any other planet. <laughs> really, the coral reefs, the oceans, the tropical rainforests, the deserts, what a beautiful home we have. But we all know that this home is in big trouble because we are part of this home and we are out of balance. Human societies are out of balance. This is the biggest crisis that humanity has faced in my lifetime at least. This is a very big crisis and everyone in this audience understands that. We are in unity in understanding about this crisis. Our home has a fever, and that is called climate change. The Earth's atmosphere has been changed by our action. The chemistry of the oceans has been changed. This is a crisis. 2015 was the hottest year ever recorded since 1880, since records began being kept. We cannot deny that. January of 2016, the hottest January ever recorded. February, the hottest February ever recorded. March was the hottest month ever recorded on the planet. Not just the hottest March, the hottest month. I'm a coral reef scientist and I am concerned. The very first system that is predicted to collapse is the coral reef system. And right now as I speak, coral reefs all over the planet are in dire condition of decline. We thought we were making so much progress and we were in conservation of those reefs. We had only lost 20% of those reefs and we were making progress in saving the rest. But beginning last year and in continuing the longest coral reef bleaching ever recorded, where the corals have become white and very sick, and most of them, the ones that have bleached, are going on to die. And in Great Barrier Reef, 93% of the reefs surveyed have major bleaching going on right now. And on the severe northern part of the reef, the severely bleached reefs, over 90% of the corals less than 1% actually of the corals are, are not bleached. So it's a huge die-off. So it's the biggest die-off in history. So with climate change, because the coral reefs are the most sensitive of all the systems, this is the system that we have to work on saving now. If we can save this system, we can save the planet. If we fail to save the coral reefs, what system is next? The mangroves will go as the waves crash into the mangroves. The seagrasses will go. The beaches will go. This is very serious. We must make a stand. And coral reefs is the natural point of making a stand. Coral reefs are incredibly important to the island nations of the world, the tropical coasts. The foundation of our, our economy is tourism. And the tourists come for the beaches, they come for the beautiful snorkeling and diving. If the reef is gone, our economy is affected greatly. Coral reefs also provide the foundation of our food security. Many of our islands, that's the primary protein source. And it's very healthy. Fish is the healthiest of all the proteins, anyway, and delicious. So we lose the reefs, we lose this richness. Coral reefs protect our islands, they protect our shores. And they build our islands. Entire nations are built by coral reefs. If we lose coral reefs, we will lose entire islands. The sea is coming up, it's rising. Coral reefs can grow faster than the present rates of rising if they're healthy. But if they're dead, they won't keep up with the sea level rise. So even as sea level rises, they will provide a protection as long as they're healthy. Now, coral reefs are a combination of many plants and animals living together, including fish and lobsters. 
And if all the fish and lobsters are there and, and octopus and everything, you have a healthy system. And parrotfish are one very important thing. As a coral dies naturally, some corals do die, and parrotfish grind those dead corals up and they produce sand. So when you, next time you go to the beach, think about it. You are having a great time building a sand castle. It's really just parrotfish poop. <laughs> okay, so, so overfishing and things like that can da damage that system. We need the fish as integral, integral to the coral reef. So corals actually do not uh, stand a much of a chance without the fish. I'll get back to that in a little while. Okay, what are corals? Are corals animals, plants, or are they rocks? Well, they have polyps and they, they are animals. If you look, you can actually see on this picture, you can actually see the little polyps close up. They're like a little flower, they have a little mouth, they have tentacles and they move. But inside those animals are brown algae, microscopic algae, which most of the energy of those corals comes from the sunlight. So they are photosynthetic. So they are plants in a sense as well. And they are definitely rocks because if you step on them, you cut your feet. If you hit your boat engine, you broke the engine. Okay, so they are all three. It's the only thing like it. It's a miracle species. We need those corals. And they are very fragile and they're very delicate. The polyps are more like, they're naked. So it's more like the inside of our eye. If we get a drop of gasoline in our eye, woo, or chili or anything, any chemical that's in the water interacts directly with the tissues of the coral. So they're very sensitive. When there's Muddy runoff, that affects the corals. And disease organisms come, bacteria, viruses, fungi. Most of the coral diseases are actually coming from the land. They, even the human intestinal bacteria cause, cause, have been implicated in, in the coral disease. Overfishing can damage the reef. There are many things that eat corals. You know, corals are good food, so lots of snails, crown of thorns, starfish, a lot of things eat corals. And normally they're not a problem, but if you remove the things that control the coral killers, those coral killers will kill the whole reef. If you remove the lobsters, you get a plague of snails that are coral killing types of snails. If you remove crown of, um, tritons, trumpets, and humphead wrasses, you'll get the crown of thorns, starfish. Okay, so how do we protect coral reefs? We gotta have all the species there. So, the scientists came up with this great idea, no fishing areas. Well, guess where they got it from? The Pacific Islands. This was a traditional thousand-year-old idea. You close an area of reef, you make a tambu, or tapu, or kapu, right? And there were permanent tambu areas on the reef, sacred reefs that no one would ever fish. And so, with that natural balance, and the fish would spill out. There would be reproduction, there would be all the health was maintained, and you had many more fish for the communities to eat. So scientists say we should close 30% of the reef for maximum fisheries. Okay, now I'm going to tell you my story. Okay, I'm a marine biologist, as I said. I was in Micronesia from the time I was a child in the Pacific Islands. And I got married in 1979, and my wife and I moved to Micronesia. In the, in, I was teaching school in one of the islands. And we noticed a lot of hunger, a lot of suffering. If you look at the children, you'll see the large stomach. It's a sign of protein deficiency. You see the swollen eyes, vitamin A deficiency. The children couldn't see at night. And they were deficient because there are no vegetables in this place. They don't get their vitamin A from carrots. They get it from fish eyes and fish liver. The traditional vegetable in many places in the Pacific is, are the insides and the head of the fish because they have tree crops, coconuts and breadfruit. They don't have a place to grow cabbages or carrots, right? So the people were suffering because the reef was dead. And that's what got me interested in this. They had the highest, at this time, they had the highest suicide rate on the planet in this group of islands. And the young men in particular were killing themselves. And it turns out that this is how young men become from child to adult, is to go out and go fishing, spearing the fish, fighting the sharks for your string of fish. All those manly things that you do on the reef to, to bring home food to your family. And that was important socially. Without the fish, it was destroying the culture. Okay, dynamite fishing. It breaks the corals up, and I, I started studying this and found out the corals can come on the pieces of broken coral. New, new baby ones come, but they turn over. And, and so they die. So 
I tried breaking up corals, branches of corals, and throwing them down, and I got instant reef. Instant reef. This is in about 1980. And so I was very encouraged, and people said, Austin, you should go get a degree on this one. So I wanted to go and study this, so I went to the Caribbean. Why the Caribbean? Because the Caribbean was further along in population pressure. And this is a Caribbean reef, but most of the reefs do not look like that. They've lost over two-thirds of their coral on the reefs of the Caribbean. And so I wanted to study these staghorn corals because they are the tree-like ones that the fish I like to stay in. And these are endangered species. So they became endangered species listed in 2006, the very first coral species on the endangered list. This is a bleached one. Major bleaching hit the Caribbean in 2005 and wiped out. There's probably 1% left or, or less. But the promising thing is that what was surviving didn't, that didn't bleach was thermally tolerant. It was strong. The ones that didn't get disease were strong. So the few that were left were stronger. And I started working on my thesis and testing corals. And you can see some of the corals, this is in 2005 bleaching. Some of the corals are bleached and some are not. Some are half bleached. And you can select the corals. Okay, so these are the methods. You see cookies, lines, different things. Beautiful growth, very encouraging. We get beautiful visitors to encourage us even more. The corals are growing, the fish are coming back. The frame method, you can see, you can barely see them in the beginning and at six months, at 12 months and at 18 months. They have to be trimmed because they're starting to kill each other, they're growing so fast. And so with these trimmed corals, we can plant ropes, which even grow faster. And in a year, they're like this. And, oh my gosh, the corals grow so fast. And this is the endangered species. This is the best fish habitat. This is the fastest growing coral in the world, staghorn coral. So at this point, we must trim it because it will spawn. It will convert up to 40% of its entire tissues will become sperm cells and egg cells in a mass spawning once a year. And then the corals are weak and they're likely to get disease. So we don't want them to spawn because there's so few. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> we don't want them to die of spawning. Okay, neither you. Okay, okay. so we trim them and we carry the, the fragments to restoration sites where we want them to grow and then they can spawn once they get in the restoration site. So we plug them in and they grab on by themselves in many places where it's not very strong waves. So, and the little different species, this is elkhorn coral, the cookies, and we, so this is a restored reef where there were, had been no, none of those corals before, we planted those corals, and it's amazing, very encouraging. Okay, this is Laughing Bird Key National Park in Belize. Uh, a woman there, Lisa Khan, a local woman, was studying the corals and trying to restore the elkhorn corals, the plate-like ones, and we met up with each other, we got a grant, and in 2009, we went there and we started working on the staghorn corals. I showed her the techniques. And in 2005, those two species of corals had become completely extinct. And based upon the work that I started and that she's continued with all her volunteers, they've planted over 50,000 corals. And the entire reef that was dead has come alive. And it's been, this is the best example I know of. The problem is, this is the best example. Where are the examples? other examples in the world. This has to be done on much more massive scale because the scientists are predicting that by the year 2050, the coral reefs will be gone as a system. And now that we've had this massive bleaching, they may up the year, maybe 30 years, uh, instead of 30 years, 20 years. We have to do this on a massive scale. And so this is my concept, coral gardening. We have to ask the resorts, the tourism industry, look, you're the ones benefiting from the reef. You're the ones, your industry will collapse if the reef is gone. Can you please hire a coral gardener if we train them? It'll only be local staff, one or two. It's not gonna cost millions of dollars. Can you hire one? We have hundreds of resorts in this country, in Fiji. So what would they do? Just what I did. They would get the resistant corals, make nurseries. They would, when they got big, prune them and make restoration patches on the reef. And the guests would love it. So you'd, get you'd work to establish no fishing areas around that so that you get the balance and you'd have to work with the communities, get the resorts and the communities to work because the communities need the reefs for their food and the resort needs the, re the reefs for their business. So everybody has, would win from that situation.
and getting everybody involved together. So corals excite people. They get people involved. It's like a ray of hope in this really dark time. We need this ray of hope. We need some hope, and this is something that people can do. And it's something that can be done on a small scale, repeated, 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 and become a major impact. The corals are beautiful. They grow quickly. We plant them to dead reefs. This was a dead reef, and look, instant reef. You just plant them there, whoop, they're in a lagoon. They don't wash away. If it's in a rough, rough place, you just cement them down. And now I'm asking you, if you like this idea, what can you do? What can you do to help save the reefs? Would you like to be a coral gardener? Are you in a situation where you could be a coral gardener? Are you a resort owner? Or do you know somebody that is? If you're a resort owner, would you hire a coral gardener? Could we start a program there? If, you have, if you're in the dive industry, would you allow us to train your divers? so that they could take care of the dive sites. If you're in the government, will you give permission so that we can do this? Trained coral gardeners can do it, not try to block us. Can you help us? Can we work together? And can the government finally start funding this because it's the foundation of the economy? Can the government fund this for the areas without tourism? So we have villages with coral gardens as well. And would you spend a holiday there? Would you enjoy staying there and, and going and seeing the coral gardens and, and, and be excited and, and support that? Because that alone would, would be powerful. So in order to save the planet, we save the reefs. In order to save the reefs, we need the coral gardening. So this is what I leave with you, you with today. Coral gardening is the way forward. Thank you.